Good afternoon. Um, as a kid, I've always been fascinated with uh, numbers and data and information that we can get through numbers. And growing up, I would often be frustrated at how my own parents would lie to me, you know, using data. Um, my father would say things like, look, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. And I'm like, no, Dad, really, you've only told me 17 times. <laughs> and, and twice it wasn't even my fault. <laughs> and I think this is one reason why I went and got a PhD in statistics. You know, I always wanted to know what is it that people try to hide with data. You know, as a statistician, I always want people to show me the data. Uh, early on, uh, when Donald and I were pregnant with our third child, uh, we were at 41 and a half weeks, which is what some of you may refer to as being overdue. Um, statisticians, we call that being within the 95% confidence interval. Um, and at this point in the process, we would go in every couple of days for a stress test. And so the stress test basically just tests, is the baby under any type of undue pressure in the womb? Um, and so these are pretty routine. You go into the hospital. Rarely are you ever seen by your actual doctor, just whoever happens to be working in the ER or working uh, in the hospital that day. So we go in, and after 20 minutes, the doctor comes out, and he says, your baby is under a stress. We need to induce you. Now, for those of you who may not know, induction means that they need to sort of artificially put you into labor, sort of jumpstart the process. So give you a drug to take to get your, get your labor pains to start. And we weren't a fan of induction. So induction also leads to lots of complications during delivery. So if at all possible, we wanted to avoid being induced. So you can imagine as a statistician, well, what was my response? Show me the data. Show me the data. I had data about my body that told a different story. And so I told you for the past six years, I have been taking my waking body temperature. Every morning I'd get up, take my temperature, and then I'd go back to sleep. And my sweet husband would come along, pick up that thermometer, and record that temperature every day. So even when we would argue, we'd have to communicate about temperatures. It'd be like, what are the temperatures? <sighs> so it was great. So every day we had to talk about this temperature. And what did this data show? Well, actually, if I look back at some of my charts, believe it or not, we could actually closely pinpoint conception. Yeah. I think I'm going to share that story at my son's wedding reception. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> my temperature was a sizzling 98.3 degrees <laughs> as I gazed into your father's eyes. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but what does the data show? So let's look at a typical chart. Here's a chart of a woman's waking body temperature over the course of a cycle. Right, so it starts from one menstrual period, maybe four, five, six days, through the end of her cycle to the beginning of the next period. And what you'll notice is that the data is not random. Right, you clearly see two distinct levels. So there's a lower set of temperatures and there's a higher set of temperatures. So what's causing this pattern in the data? Well, what happens is that early on in a woman's cycle, Estrogen is the dominant hormone in your cycle. And this estrogen causes your temperatures to be suppressed. And at ovulation, your body releases an egg. And then the hormone progesterone takes over, or progestation. And it signals to the body, hey, there's a chance that we might get pregnant. We need to warm up. We need to heat up just in case we get pregnant during this cycle. And so ladies, why is it that our body heats up? Well, if you think about when a bird lays on eggs, right, why does she lay on her eggs? To keep them warm. And this is exactly what the women's body, what our bodies do. They heat up in anticipation of keeping this tiny little fertilized egg warm. And so what happens is that at the end of your cycle, right, so if you don't get pregnant, then your temperature drops back down, the hormone estrogen takes back over, and this starts all over again. But if you do get pregnant, you often see a second temperature shift. Your body really heats up to keep that baby warm, and it stays elevated for the entire course of the pregnancy. Here's a chart that we were so excited about. So this is actually my chart from a few years back. So you'll see I had some low temperatures uh, at the beginning when estrogen was dominant, and then you'll see a shift. And then you'll notice that after about five days, you start to see those temperatures go up again. So about five days, that's the time that it takes the baby, the fertilized egg, to travel down your fallopian tube 
tube and implant into the uterine wall. And so once that baby implants, he or she will signal to the brain, I'm here, you need to make this environment really comfortable for me, and your body heats up again. So this was our cycle. We were really excited. We had 21 days of elevated temperature that confirms pregnancy. We also took a pregnancy test, which also confirmed that we were pregnant. So we were pretty excited about that. But then I noticed that my temperature started to fall, and I saw some spotting, and actually I started my cycle again. And so, had we not been charting, I would have just thought this was a late period, which is what a lot of us think, when in actuality, it was an early stage miscarriage. So this temperature data, even in this uh, instance, although it revealed sort of a really unfortunate event in our life, it also gave us data to take to our doctor. Right, so we could go to the doctor and say, look, here's our data. We got pregnant, here's a temperature shift, here's a second shift, we took a pregnancy test, and then we lost this baby. You know, what happened? What can we do to try to address the situation? And so it's not just about temperatures, though. We can actually use information from our body to, to speak to us. Our body speaks to us in lots of other different ways. Uh, early on in our marriage, um, Donald had this really bad stuffy nose, and he was really congested. And um, he started taking all these different medications. He was trying to uh, relieve himself, and, and none of them were working. So he woke me up in the middle of the night one night. He's like, honey, I can't breathe out of my nose. I'm like, okay, okay, can you, can you breathe out of your mouth? He's like, yes, but I can't breathe out of my nose. So, okay, okay, and so like any you know, good newlywed wife, I rush into the emergency room <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, and the whole time I'm thinking, you need not know. die on me now. <laughs> we just got married. <laughs> People will think I killed you <laughs> with my cooking. <laughs> so we get to the emergency room and we check in, and, and the doctor, they send us to the back, and he says, well, what seems to be the problem? And Donald's like, I can't breathe out of my nose. And you can't breathe out of your nose? No. <laughs> He takes a look at us and he says, sir, I, I clearly see what the problem is here. Great. You're having a heart attack. Uh, we're going to order an EKG and a CAT scan for you immediately. And, and I'm like, what, wait, wait, no, 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 no this, this isn't all right. He just, he can breathe out of his mouth. Like, he just can't, you know, breathe out of his nose. And so, so we go into this dialogue because this doctor believes that my husband is having a heart attack. And so we go back and forth, and fortunately for us, this doctor was at the end of his shift. And so a new ER doctor came on board, and at that point we were clearly exhausted. It's, you know, 2.45 in the morning. And so he proceeds to ask us questions. He said, well, what were you doing before you came to the emergency room? And I'm like, oh, I was sleeping. And, uh, okay, yeah, and so Donald will she's to tell him, well, I took this slew of medications. I took all these, you know, uh, pills, and, and then I took this nasal decongestion, and, and then I took this, um, this allergy medication, and then he says, oh, oh, you never want to take these two things at the same time because they don't work well together. Here, take this prescription instead. And he hands us a prescription for an allergy medication. And he sends us. And I look at him and I said, well, wait, why is it that you seem to accurately diagnose the problem and this other guy was going to you know, give us an EKG and a CAT scan? And he said, well, you know, when a 350-pound man walks into the emergency room and says he can't breathe, you assume he's having a heart attack, and you ask questions later. <laughs> so emergency room doctors are trained to make fast decisions, but not always accurate decisions. And so maybe had we had a little bit more information about our health to provide, we could have helped that first doctor to make a more accurate decision of our diagnosis. Here's another chart I want you to have a look at. This is solid blood pressure from October of 2010 to July of 2012. What you'll notice for this individual is that this blood pressure started in the pre-hypertension, almost hypertension zone. And after a little over a year and a half, it decreased to a perfectly normal zone, the healthy blood pressure of a 16-year-old. And so you might want to know, well, who, whose blood pressure would this even belong to? Right, well, believe it or not, this person is actually here today who this data belongs to. And so after a year and a half of healthy eating and exercise, that sweet 350-pound man that walked with me into the emergency room is now a spelt, sexy, 